Hello everyone and welcome to this short biopsychology video on localization of function in the brain. Okay, now before I start, just a quick heads up. Biologists among you might find that at various points within the video, you feel like you know more about the biology than I'm giving you. And that's fine. It's also probably true. The only reason I'm not going into more detail on the biology side of things is because you don't need it for A-level psychology. So for simplicity's sake, and to ensure that I'm only giving you what you need for A-level psychology, those extra bits of detail are going to be left out. But please don't panic if you get to one of those stages in the video um i'm not leaving things out that are important um like i say i am only including the things that you'll need for a level psychology okay here we go so localization of function what is it now it's essentially the idea that different parts of the brain are involved in different tasks and are associated with different behaviors the opposite of localization of function in the brain is something called holism, um, and that is the belief that the whole brain is implicated in behaviors and functions. Okay, so localization of function is that functions, tasks, behaviors are dealt with or carried out by specific areas in the brain. Now, it's important for you to understand how the brain is structured. So your brain, as you can see in this picture here, has two symmetrical hemispheres, uh, the left and the right hemisphere. Um, some of our physical and psychological functions are controlled or dominated by a particular hemisphere, and that is called lateralization or hemispheric lateralization. That's something that you will come across in the, in the later topics in biopsychology, but it's important for you to realize that here as well. As a general rule, activity on the left-hand side of the body is controlled by your right hemisphere, and activity on the right-hand side of your body is controlled by your left hemisphere. Now, the outer layer of both hemispheres is called your cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex is like a tea cozy, and it covers the inner parts of your brain and it's about three millimeters thick. Your cerebral cortex is what separates us from other animals because the human cerebral cortex is much more developed. So you can see that on the picture here, it's very creased and crinkly. That shows how developed it actually is. If you were to compare a human cerebral cortex to a chicken's cerebral cortex, for example, you would see that the cerebral cortex of a chicken is smooth or the brain of a chicken is almost smooth. Okay, so humans have very, very, very highly developed um, brains and a very highly developed cerebral cortex. Um, the cortex is very often called gray matter as well, um, and that's because it looks gray um, due to the location of cell bodies. Um, so if you ever hear me talk about uh, more developed gray matter or more gray matter, then that means that the cerebral cortex is more densely packed. Okay, moving on. Now, your cerebral cortex is split into different lobes, four lobes to be exact. And the lobes are named after the bones beneath which they lie. So you've got the frontal lobe at the front there, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. And each lobe is associated with different functions. So your frontal lobe or the back of your frontal lobe is your motor area or your motor cortex. The motor cortex controls voluntary movements in the opposite side of the body. So the left motor cortex or the left motor area controls voluntary movement in the right side of your body and vice versa. If you were to damage this area, then that might result in a loss of control over voluntary movements or fine motor movements. 
At the front of both the parietal lobes, so the left and the right parietal lobe, is your somatosensory cortex. The somatosensory cortex is where sensory information from the skin, for example, related to touch or heat or pressure, is represented. The amount of somatosensory area devoted to a particular body part denotes its sensitivity. So what that means is, for example, receptors for our face and hands occupy over half of the somatosensory area because you know these are particularly sensitive areas for touch, um, pressure, heat, etc. In the occipital lobe at the back of the brain is your visual area or your visual cortex. Each eye sends information from the right visual field to the left visual cortex and from the left visual field to the right visual cortex. So that means that damage to the left hemisphere, for example, can produce blindness in part of the right visual field of both eyes. Now, just to be clear, when I talk about visual field, that doesn't mean your right and your left eye. Okay, so your left visual field is made up of the right half of both of your eyes, and your right visual field is made up of the left half of both of your eyes, just like you can see here. Okay, and then, like I said, um, the right visual field is processed by the left visual cortex and vice versa. Okay, so it's always the opposite way around. Left deals with right and right deals with left. The final area is the auditory area. The temporal lobe is home to the auditory cortex or the auditory area, and this particular area analyzes speech-based information. Damage in this particular area may produce partial hearing loss, um, and obviously the more extensive the damage, the more extensive the loss. Additionally, um, damage to a specific area of the temporal lobe, uh, known as Wernicke's area, which we're going to talk about in a minute, could affect your ability to comprehend speech. Okay, so you've got two more areas right here, which I'm just going to quickly throw up. So that's Broca's area and Wernicke's area, and I will go into more detail of those in a moment. Okay, but those are your four lobes, and they are some of the more important areas of the cerebral cortex. You will need to know what they're called, you will need to know what they do, and you will most likely need to be able to apply your knowledge to a question. It's very, very popular to get asked a question about somebody who's had a stroke, for example, and now can't do certain things, and you might need to explain why. Okay, moving on then to the final little bit of the outline, um, and that's just about the language areas of the brain. So I threw them up quickly earlier. They're called Broca's area and Wernicke's area. Um, so Broca's area is in the left-hand frontal lobe, and it's all about speech production, so fluidity of speech. People who damage Broca's area, whether it's through some kind of disease or condition or through a stroke or something like that, they will often develop something known as Broca's aphasia, which, which is symptomized or characterized by slow and laborious speech. So somebody with Broca's aphasia will take a very, very long time to get um, single words or sentences out. Uh, they might actually never be able to do it. So they have very, 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 very slow and very laborious speech. Wernicke's area, on the other hand, is located in the left temporal lobe. And Wernicke's area is all about speech comprehension. So people who have damaged Wernicke's area can actually produce speech without a problem, but they find it difficult to understand what's being said to them, and they also find it difficult to actually produce a sentence that makes sense. So Wernicke's aphasia is characterized by a lack of speech understanding. 
and understanding in this case means being able to understand what's being said and also being able to produce something that makes sense. If you need an example of what that might look like, uh, there are lots and lots of videos on YouTube with patients who have Broca's, area, uh, Broca's aphasia or Wernicke's aphasia that you can just have a little bit of a look at uh, so you can see what I mean. Okay, now just very quickly then I will move on to a couple of evaluation points. So remember we are arguing for the fact that function is localized in the brain. So our first little bit of evidence is the fact that there is plenty of studies and plenty of supporting evidence for the localization of function, uh, particularly in things like language and memory. So for example, you've got two studies there, uh, one by Peterson and one by Tolving. The one by Tolving you might recognize from when you did long-term memory in year one, but there are two ways uh, or two studies which have shown that um, neurological functions are in fact localized. Okay, so you've got a nice peel paragraph for you there to use in your evaluations. Okay, I'll just go through two more, although these aren't peeled, they're just in bullet points, but I will walk you through them um, and then you, you'll be able to use them if you wish. So you've also got an evaluation point on neurosurgery. So neurosurgery or lobotomies uh, is the practice of surgically removing or destroying areas of the brain in order to try and control certain aspects of behavior. It was very, very common practice in the 1950s, um, and they were fairly horrible. They were quite brutal, quite imprecise, and you can see in the picture there what it would involve. Um, it was very often done to people uh, to try and control aggressive behavior. For example, they would try and destroy areas of the frontal lobe, as you can see here. Now, controversially, neurosurgery is still used today. It's used very sparingly and only in very extreme cases, but it is still used, sometimes for people with OCD, sometimes for people with depression. Um, but again, like I say, sparingly and controversially as well. So an example of that would be Doherty in 2002. Doherty reported on 44 OCD patients who had undergone a procedure known as a cingulotomy, which is a neurosurgical procedure that involves destroying or lesioning parts of the cingulate gyrus. At a post-surgical follow-up, after 32 weeks, one-third had met the criteria for a successful response to the, th to the surgery, and 14% had a partial positive response. So the success of procedures like this also strongly suggests that symptoms between behaviors, the success of procedures like this suggests that symptoms and behaviors associated with serious mental disorders are localized. Okay, and then we'll do one more, and that is the fact that there is case study evidence. Uh, for those of you who recognize that picture on the right there, that is Phineas Gage. Now, Phineas Gage was a man who used to work on the railroads in the 1800s, um, and he uh, one day was caught in an explosion which resulted in a long metal pole um, going through his skull. Now, he didn't die, but the pole did end up tearing out most of his frontal lobe. And what then happened was that he became very, very short-tempered. He became very rude, very aggressive, very inappropriate. Um, so his personality changed massively because before this happened, before his accident, he was a very mild-mannered, very nice man, a gentleman, you would even say. So... This particular case study suggests that the frontal lobe might actually be responsible for regulating your mood, which, again, supports the idea of localization. Right, I'm going to leave it there. 
uh, with three evaluation points. I hope this video has been useful. Um, biopsychology is traditionally a topic that people sometimes don't look forward to uh, because they think it's difficult. I hope that the video has been useful and has shown you that it's actually not so bad and has been helpful. So thank you very much for listening and look out for the next video, which will be up shortly. Thank you.